Hi everyone, welcome back to the second strand of uh, Next Stop Spain, uh, sponsored by the Embassy of Spain. We have uh, Luis López Carrasco, Andrea Morana and Fernando Vilchez joining us for a conversation now about their films. Um, there they are. First of all, I'd like to thank them all for uh, allowing us to, to screen their films, uh, films that we love and that um, we really admire what they do. And um, I guess my first question for all of you, the three of you, is uh, how did the idea of the, of the film came about? How did you start um, the project? Uh, starting by Luis. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, well, I, I mean, this, um, this project here uh, starts with, um, it's a, a production from a, a museum of Manchester, in fact home Manchester, and um, uh, uh, the director, uh, Sarah Perks, uh, contacted me uh, because they were preparing an exhibition about La Movida, La Movida Madrileña, and, and uh, well, I, I'm, I'm not sure why, I mean, they, they, they contacted me because I have made uh, El Futuro uh, just uh, the, the year before, and it was a, a film about 1982, so they decided that it would be interesting to commission a a short film for the for the exhibition, and so I, I had a lot of um, my footage from the previous film. I had a lot of materials, and and I was trying to think of doing something like that. This was, I mean, taking advantage of the previous film, but in the summer, in the in the week, I had to uh, uh, present the project. I read in a magazine uh, with, with whose title is El Estado Mental, uh, this interview of Tessa Arranz, which is not exactly an interview, it's like a monologue, uh, but it's about a, conver it's a conversation between, uh, between a journalist, Germán, Germán Pose and Tessa, and, and the journalist um, uh, convert this conversation into a monologue. So when I uh, read this uh, monologue, I, I knew about Tessa before, but it, it, it was a kind of uh, hidden character. No, nobody knew uh, where she was in that moment. So this interview is like a, an appearance. And so when I, I read that uh, monologue, I decided to make uh, the, the project for the exhibition adapting this monologue. Uh, because I've, I've, I have the feeling that um, the way she spoke about La Movida uh, it's uh, it's not very common in Spain. I mean, uh, when they, uh, the mainstream media reflects on the this cultural scene, uh, they always are they idealize a lot. It's like, like every famous uh, director or painter or musician are always um, being very indulgent about uh, this cultural scene. So I like a lot uh, how hard and how explicit and how um, and the way uh, Tessa speaks about that moment so I I, I, I I make this proposition and the Museum of Manchester agree mm -hmm. and what about uh, Andrea and Fernando yes well it came from a personal experience because I was in the hospital for a few weeks and it was uh, pretty bad I couldn't go outside of course and I couldn't walk, I couldn't read because I was feeling very dizzy all the time. So Fernando had this idea of sending me uh, sounds from the, the world, from the outside. Uh, first of all, there were sounds from the streets or the places we used to go, the, the subway I remember I used to take. And later on he asked some friends we have in common to send me some text, like readings, so they would send me uh, voice notes, voice messages with the, the readings, um, the text that they want me to hear so I could uh, cheer up or maybe laugh or feel less alone, finally. And I received like a lot of well novels and poems, but also um, news articles, even a speech. Mm -hmm. And when that uh, finished and I got better and I came back home, um, I think we were challenged by this idea of um, turning these sounds into images and, and think we wonder if we could like transform this experience in a cinematic feeling and how we could, yes, uh, capture all the good things because there were bad things but also good things like this friendship or this 
closeness we feel with these people. So uh, yeah, that's that's why, and we wanted also to yeah to to capture to keep in mind this freedom that you feel when you go outside and you can like enjoy like the fresh air that you don't have in a hospital, of course. Mm. I guess with this uh, like COVID-19 situation, it's kind of like got a new meaning now, the film. And like I was speaking to you before and I said I watched it whilst I was like a month and a half in this confinement and I was looking at Madrid and I was like, oh my God, like, <laughs> it's such a, such a good film. And, and yeah, thank you for that. And Fernando, do you have anything to add or? No, no, I just, oh, well, um, you just said about, said about the, the COVID-19, this moments and I feel it's very I mean when we watch it again um at these weeks during these weeks it feels like a lot of actuality so every pandemic situation this short film will be amazing to watch. <laughs> it's good for the future yeah. Um Luis uh you've uh, spoken about um the film and how Tessa kind of had a different view about the movida and I think it's a common theme on your films that you kind of like revisit or sort of like try to retell certain parts of the history of Spain um, through like fresh eyes and I was wondering if, um, if you could tell us a bit more about your intentions um, with filmmaking and, and these films. Yeah, well, um, um, yeah, the, 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 I think the, for me the, and, and the collective Los Hijos where I started to make films with Javier and Natalia the economic crisis of 2008, I think it changed the way we approach to cinema. And in my case, I have the need of looking back to the recent past to understand a, bit, a little bit little bit better um, the present, because I was completely um, confused. Uh, in 2010, I had the feeling that the country had changed or the country had been replaced. <laughs> and I didn't have the skills or the tools to live in this new Spain after the collapse. And the way of, of having a orientation in this uh, daily routine in the present was trying to understand better the past. So every film I made uh, the, since that moment, it was a tr uh, an, an, an attempt to to understand some aspects that maybe we we didn't focus so much and that could uh, allow us to understand why Spanish society or European society are in the moment of uh, strange moments that they are. So, for example, Tessa Aranz and their uh, speech was really interesting because uh, you have to f the, the exhibition was about La Movida. And there weren't a lot of artists of Spain or, or Madrid. It was a kind of, they, they, they were trying to put back the La Movida spirit. I mean, a kind of English consideration about that. Uh, but at the same time, there was a kind of retrospective and about and a kind of homenaje, uh, como se diría homenaje? A tribute. A tribute. For, so, for example, you have Bruce Labrus pictures of these famous people of the 80s, uh, you know, like in religious uh, poses. I mean, you have all this tribute to La Movida. And in the end of the exhibition, you have this short film where Tessa is really kicking everybody's ass of La Movida. So for me, what's very interesting to put this kind of uh, strange object inside an exhibition like that. So this way of discussing uh, the, the the storytellings that uh, as society we gave to ourselves is important in, in every movie that I've been making in this last years. And uh, Fernando and Andrea, uh, Madrid is like another character in your film as well. Um, and I wonder like uh, what is the meaning of all of those places that you chose and, and the people that are in the film. Um, I can speak about the places, maybe, Fernando. Um, most of them are places we usually go to. I mean, we wanted to point out that sometimes you visit some places every day, or you walk through streets uh, daily, 
and you don't pay attention to them. And maybe uh, when you look closer, but also when you look through a camera lens, and a 16 millimeters camera lens, you perceive the reality in a different way. And also you can find out some, some beauty in, in these places, in these spaces. So um, I guess that now thinking about the, um, the settings, but also the, the shooting, like when we decided to shoot what, like in the morning, in the afternoon, um, I guess that the, the main factor was the light. It was very important and that's why the short film has all this colorful and vivid aspect, the light. Um, also, of course, we chose uh, outdoors uh, places uh, because we wanted to uh, feel uh, this, uh, this freedom that I was talking before. And it's important also the presence of people because um, in some way, I know that the, the film is very intimate. It's like one character in front of the camera, one reading, but also we wanted some balance between these personal readings and the, the presence of people, the feeling that you're surrounded by people and by, by life, right? So uh, that's why you can see El Retiro, this huge park in Madrid. You can see El Rastro, the flea market, or, or even the, the, the coffee shop or the park that are like more uh, shots that we were not looking for, but we just found this uh, dancer in the park. So that's why some of the images were thought in advance and another ones were found, found by by Fernando, by me, and Ian de Sosa, that was the, the diploma. Fernando, anything to add? Uh, yeah, I mean, no. no. <laughs> Maybe the, the characters, like, because I don't okay. know if they are characters or they are just people, like friends. Um, uh, yes, yes, of course. Yeah, I haven't seen the, the the Fernando and Andrea short film, and I have to say that I I, I haven't seen Madrid as a film. Uh, I mean, I haven't. I, I I really didn't remember. I mean, it, I, for me, it was amazing how Madrid is being portrayed. I mean, I had to think of a lot of films maybe in the seventies. It's like in forty years, nobody was able to. Uh, portrait Madrid until your short film. I think it's very, very, because it, it's something about the light, it's something about the buildings, but uh, the experience of being in the city, it's something very difficult because we try as collective and we fail. And it's been very, very uh, um, uh, wonderful the way that you portrayed the city. It's not about beauty, but it's about the, the reality of the, of the places. Exactly. This is the, the, the issue. I mean, of course, if you think that, okay, let's shoot the El Retiro, it's like a postcard, right? This is this, the danger. But um, some, something about the time in the shooting, about the, the way uh, Young also put the camera, um, that make it so realistic. And this, this realism make it uh, very close to the intimacy. I mean, when you see objects, when you see a street, a very normal street, um, I think the the more real it feels, is the more close you can feel it inside. So I think it was some something like this the idea to maybe to get away of the beauty of the city. And uh, you were talking about uh, filming in 16 millimeters, and your film as well raises, I think it's VHS and Super 8 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering mm -hmm. uh, why you choose to work with these formats, or what can um, analog film bring that digital can't? Mm -hmm. I think it was the um, for different reasons. In some way, the the film is a um, gesture of of resistance of objects, of people, or readings, you know, these things, uh, places that they uh, they wouldn't become uh, traces or ghosts, no? You have to make very sure these places are still here, these readings, these friends are still here, they're waiting for you, for the people in the hospital. And in, in, this, uh, in this sense, this resistance in, in, it was very real with the 60 millimeters because uh, not only because it's the celluloid of the lights of the lenses. I mean, the, the film is not uh, something changeable, or very mutable like 
digital, uh, which if you think in the digital um, uh, formats, they're changing like every two or three years. Um, and the film is a solid, a tangible object. You know, it's a, a hundred years later, it, you will still have to sell it with you. Uh, but this is like a concept. Of course, there's some uh, reasons like the light, as Andrea said, the light was maybe the key part of the way we think uh, the formats. And the light, the day light in the 60 millimeters, it was totally different, of course, with a digital camera and uh, all this ray and traces in the faces of the people. Uh, I think it was very close also to the nostalgic correspondence between these filmmakers who make um, very independent films, like a letters, like a correspondence, and they use the 60 millimeters in the in their works. So it was also like some kind of connection with this idea of the of communication. Yes, and I think we also like the idea that you can say this was shot in 2020 or 2019. You may say, ah, it's uh, 1970 because the rastro is like, so it's like a temporal, you don't know where was uh, this happening. And we, we like this idea that it will pass time, but the film remains the same in a sense. Mm -hmm. And what about you? With... Well, there was also this idea of, of choosing a format, a video format that belonged to the 80s. In this case, it's a home video format, the VHSC, but also a high eight. And uh, the, the, the original idea was to, to um, make that the, f the shots that John de Sosa and me were filming, because we shared the DOP in both short films, um, that they were like the, the footage of a television that you're going to watch in the end. No? There was this idea of connecting the texture between the archive, I mean, the original footage, and what we were shooting just to make this, um, uh, to create this ambiguity at the beginning, not, not knowing exactly when you start to see the, the short film, if, if this has been shot nowadays or some years before. And in the moment that uh, you, you know that uh, it's been uh, shot uh, nowadays, it's when Tessa appears, that it's the moment when she said, she says that she uh, had the bipolar disorder. And then she has these hallucinations when she sees herself old. And you are seeing her old in the short film. So it, it creates a kind of extreme temporary disorder also in the, in the film. Um, uh, yeah, so that, that was the, 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 main, uh, the main idea of doing it in, in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And did Tessa have any creative in inputs in the film or um, whilst you were making it? Yeah, well, uh, the process was interesting because um, um, I contacted the magazine, they put me in contact to the journalist and the journalist agreed to participate and then he put me in contact with Tessa. Mm -hmm. We have a little budget, so it was very, very. I, I, I was really thankful to the con Contemporary Museum to produce the film because everything was really easy. And then I contacted Tessa on the phone, and she uh, said that she was really okay about doing the, the film. But, and she sent me everything she has uh, painted or wrote. Write, wrote uh, in the last 20 years or 30 years. So she, she sent me, we, we didn't know each other because Tessa lives in Valencia, she sent me 1,000 poems to drama plays, uh, one in verse, verso, I mean, uh, two novels, and all his paintings, I mean, picture of the paintings, uh, diaries. And so I, for, for two months or three months, I had to process, process, process I mean, to, to read and see everything she was sending me. And in that moment, I, I was really, um, I have a lot of responsibility in myself because I understand that she, she was trusting me a lot. 
no? Um, and because in the original idea of the film, uh, I, we, we were going to do a lot of experiments with the texture of the video. I mean, we were trying to use VHS to recreate how um, the visions or the problems or the hallucinations that she may have for the problems of, I mean, we were trying to, to, to make a kind of uh, trip in the texture of the VHS, but uh, with all the, when you portrait somebody, when you do nonfiction and do a portrait of and, and somebody that it's between us, uh, I mean, I have uh, a strong responsibility about how we have to, how I have to portrait somebody as complex as Tessa. So I decided to um, low all my author uh, uh, impulse just to make the film as, as as easy as possible to make the voice of Tessa the big the main character because I thought that the the richness and the complexity of their her storytelling uh, requires a a very um, simple and not very lively uh, aesthetical approach. Uh, but in I, I, we were open in the shooting to to make her painting or dancing because she was open to all of that and she was proposing these kind of things. But when she had, when we started to to shoot, uh, she was really confident about us and she decided just to leave us uh, shooting uh, the pictures. Okay. Um, we have a question from Adil Oliver Sharif. Uh, asking how important it is to keep the stories close to your heart and the locations too when making a film. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so, but it, it's a it's a, it's question, a question for how, how important is it it is to keep uh, I guess make wow. films about things that you love. Mm, wow. Well, maybe I can like the first answer and then you <laughs> you uh, continue because this is my third short film and well we made Nora together about this um, feminist um, demonstration on 2018 but in the other short films I they are they came from personal experience and I think of that maybe as a limit. Limitation. It's. I think it's a beautiful limitation. But I honestly can feel when something is important to me. Like it's like a need to take the, the camera and shoot something. It's like from really deep. Uh, I wish I could be a filmmaker with more uh, imagination, uh, more political ambitions. I don't know. But for me, it's really really important. And this short film. It's more than a short film. Like for us, it's it tells a lot of things. So I guess, yeah, for me, it's like key. It's a key. Anyone wants to add anything? Um, in, in my case, I think the, the space, space is always the um, one element that you should, uh, when you should, I, I should listen and, and understand and before um, what Luis said, like the author impulse. You know, of course, it's it's amazing because you have uh, you bring to the to the shooting um, maybe me very many many good ideas. But um, in my case, I, I only made non-fiction films. Uh, these ideas have to keep in the below, right, in a, in a second level, um, and understand what it is in front of the camera or in front of your your eyes or in front of the microphone. Uh, is the the most important uh, uh, this space or these objects or this person have to give you the keys of where are you going to move around the shooting? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, talking about non-fiction and as we are a short documentary only festival and we love short documentary um, with this uh, online uh, platform such as like Vice or Days or The Guardian Docs, uh, it feels like short documentaries are becoming more and more popular on an online world. And I was wondering if, if you um, could uh, see if there's like, what, what is the reason why they're popular um, and not other genres or what are the characteristics that makes it um, a good genre from online? 
screen ends. Difficult question, sorry. Mm. <laughs> um, I, I really don't know. No, I mean, I, 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 I um, this is my first experience uh, watching online streaming in a festival. So, and it's been it's been a very very good experience. I really have the feeling that the platforms and streaming can be a really uh, interesting and useful platform. I mean, I'm, I'm not, not nostalgic of the theaters. I think they are really different experiences, and the import the the major. Uh, the, the, the importance is making the the films and the knowledge uh, circulating. I mean, I mean, I think the the, the, the way the, the the window doesn't it's not so important. Uh, but I I really didn't know that the short film documentary short films are getting. Uh, I mean, I understand that the. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe uh, I really think nonfiction is going to be uh, more in our lives because it's probably the the, the cinema that can um, um, that can uh, be uh, that can have more innovation can be can that can deal with. Uh, complex and current aspects of our reality in many, many different ways, in ways that essays and ways in, in literature, in ways that journalism cannot achieve. So for me, it's, I, I really didn't know about this short film uh, thing, uh, a trend, uh, but in the end, I think nonfiction is one of the most uh, solid futures for cinema or for people that like cinema. Mm -hmm. So I made this kind of corporative institutional statement, <laughs> embracing <laughs> myself and the thing in the, the cinema I do. But yes, yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Anything else to add? Or... No. <laughs> No, I think it's a great uh, moment for nonfiction. I guess one of the keys is saying nonfiction and instead of documentary. Maybe I guess the the audience uh, years ago maybe identify documentary with some boring cinema or this need to portray reality like in a very neutral way that it cannot happen and that nonfiction like open new paths for the filmmakers for the um, production company and also the, the audience and, and they are responding and wanting more more of these films and material. Okay. And I'm going with another difficult question. <laughs> it is, uh, you, you all work as uh, programmers and curators. Uh, Andrea and Fernando run Film Madrid, which is an amazing festival that happens in Madrid every year. And I was wondering if you have any advice for short, uh, short filmmakers um, like how to get a film on a film festival, what's the most important thing that you look out for in a, in a short film when you're programming? Hmm, it's a very tough question. Um, oh, what are well. the most errors? If that's easier, like what is the most common mistake? For example, for us... Well, Liz, uh, wants, Liz, Liz wants to say something okay, as a filmmaker, no, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, it, 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 it can sound very, very untrue, but I really think that when you are starting and preparing a project, uh, and it, it's connected where the thing that uh, the, 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 the user asked, I mean, when you are preparing a film, it's and, and I have this feeling. I'm a t when I'm in a teacher in in film schools in Madrid or in Barcelona. Sometimes the students are really uh, obsessed with uh, film festivals, and they really th make decisions thinking of oh this decision can be more Locarno or this decision can be more Rotterdam or this decision can. Uh, and in the end, I think that it's really, really important. And when I when when I was I worked in the collective, and when I work in my own, I really don't think of festivals in any moment of the process. I mean, when you prepare a film, when you shoot a film, you don't have to think of festivals. 
I mean, maybe when you are finishing the process and you are finishing the, I mean, until the, sh the film is not uh, uh, finished, it's important not to thinking of festivals. I know, uh, I mean, this, this idea is probably not good for having success uh, because I people that uh, send work in progress to festivals and depending on what the festival said, they change things of the final cut. But uh, I don't think we are speaking about how to make a career. We are thinking of how to make films that uh, respond to your needs. I mean, in the end, uh, we made films about us issues that touches us. Maybe because of personal experience, maybe because of social experience, maybe because you are lost in, the, in your country. But yeah, I don't know. I, I really think that you don't have to think of... The first thing we do in the collective, we, we like to do it, we like to shoot it, we like to edit it, and in the end we didn't know uh, if it was going to be a screen in a festival or it was going to be in a draw. But I think for me or for independent filmmaking, I mean, it's different if you are going, if it's going to be your job, of course. But as we are independent filmmakers and we are producing ourselves, um, I think the important is to learn and to enjoy the experience. And it sounds a bit, how do you say, autoayuda? Self-help. Yeah. So, so uh, I mean, it sounds a bit uh, wannabe, you guess it, but I, I really believe that. Great. That's, I think, a great advice. It's just don't listen to anyone and follow what you want to do if you're an independent filmmaker. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think we... Don't, 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 don't listen to your teachers. <laughs> <laughs> don't listen to Luis. Yeah. <laughs> don't listen. <laughs> Great. I think we're running out of time, so I'd like to end uh, the conversation by um, if you could uh, recommend a filmmaker, something you've watched during this confinement, or a filmmaker that has inspired you uh, whilst making these films, or something like that, for the audiences to look up for. Mm, yes, one one of the films that we kept in mind during the the shooting was Fluid Frankers. Uh, from um, Efraim Asili. It's a short film by an um, Afro-American uh, filmmaker. They shoot um, along the, the river of uh, his city, some readings. So we found there also this idea, well, in, in other films too, right? The idea of, of the reading. And um, he also wanted to point out the importance of these uh, magazines that were published in the 60s. So Fluid Frontiers, it's a, like, a good short film, I think, I would recommend. And, and mm -hmm. I was watching again these uh, short films by Nathaniel Dorsky, mm -hmm. especially, I think there was one, one in YouTube, so you can find it and enjoy it, it's Variations, I think. And in, has this amazing beauty of the fragments um, filming just little moments, like glimpses of lights, of movements, of um, objects. And I think we we watch it before we shoot our film, and it was amazing to watch it again uh, when you are in, in in this these weeks. Yes, e e everything for Nathaniel Dorsky. I think it's amazing. Mm -hmm. I really don't remember very much what what inspired me to make aliens, but um, I think that uh, a very an important uh, influence, no, not the influence, but the reference for um, ourselves in the collective uh, was uh, uh, Las Foto uh, Alix Pictures from Jan Eustache, a short film which is a portrait of a photographer. But it's also an essay about how we, how sound and image can uh, create something new inside the, a, short, a short film or, or how to um, um, uh, desconfiar, como sería desconfiar? Uh, Don't trust. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's an essay film as, that also build how not to trust in the filmmaker as you as a viewer, no? And I mean, this very, uh, I mean, of course, uh, Alex's picture is a, 
my major and wonderful masterpiece, but I think this very straight and simple and basic uh, way of portraying the, the pictures of Tessa must be based on, on that film that I strongly recommend. Great. Um, I think that it's not about me, but I'm going to give it a recommendation as well. I finished watching today uh, from our friends at Doc with uh, Distribution, uh, the film Black Mother by Khalid Kala. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah. Uh, we have him in Madrid. I do. It's a great film. I hadn't yeah. seen it till till today because uh, it was 2018, I think. Um, and I think it's a brilliant film. And um, if you haven't seen it, um, it you is. can go to Doc Wolf and, and watch it there. So yeah, thank you very very much to the three of you for joining us today. Uh, really enjoyed the Q and A, and thank you for letting us screen your films. Uh, to everyone, uh, we will be back here tomorrow for a distribution panel at 3 p.m. Uh, UK time and also for another Q&A of our strand uh, women at 7 p.m. in the UK uh, tomorrow on YouTube. Uh, you can find it on our website if you log into your members account. Thank you very much, everyone, and we hope you've enjoyed the event today. Thank you. Thank you to the Embassy of Spain Thank as you. well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.